to the people gathered at the Thoreau um, campus in Richmond. It is wonderful to be with you all today. And I want to thank you for the warm hospitality and welcome. I'm grateful for this opportunity to share in this powerful ministry that you all are building here. And I do want to offer a special word of gratitude to my dear friend and colleague, the Reverend Colin Bosson, an activist for love and justice. Friends, it is good to be together today. Now, I got to tell you that it is really an incredible honor to serve as president of your Unitarian Universalist Association, particularly in this time when our voices and our values are so needed. And I'm grateful, deeply grateful to each and every one of you, the leaders, the members, the staff, everyone who is a part of this congregation for your commitment to this liberating faith. The times that we live in right now offer us daily reminders of how much our faith matters and how much it is needed. For ours is a life-changing, life-affirming, and life-saving faith. And I know this personally because when I was five years old, Unitarian Universalism first saved my life. When I was five years old, the people, the ministry, and two very special religious education teachers at Elliott Chapel in St. Louis dramatically changed the course of my life. You see, when I was young and for most of my childhood, my family was falling apart. A more accurate word would be erupting. Now, there were a lot of reasons for it, including that my parents' marriage was on the verge of divorce. But what it meant was that during my childhood, my home was not a peaceful or joyful place. But I have another very powerful memory from my young life, and it was of my kindergarten Sunday school class. The class was taught by a newly married couple and what I still remember vividly to this day is how much they seemed to love each other and how much fun we had in that class. They would play guitar and sing, and we five-year-olds would dance and sing along, and it was joy. And wow, did I need that joy. I wrapped it around me. It was one hour once a week for a few months in my life. But it stayed with me, and it made such a difference in my life. Now, to be clear, too many, far too many children experience much worse. And studies increasingly show how these early childhood experiences can affect our long-term health, health outcomes, including the development of addiction and mental health challenges. And not all stories have such good outcomes. But studies also show the outsized difference that a great teacher, a caring mentor, even the small presence of real love and care can make in the lives of children who experience pain, neglect, or trauma. Mary Oliver tells us that if you feel joy suddenly and unexpectedly, don't hesitate. Perhaps joy is life's way of fighting back. This Sunday school class, even though I didn't have the words for it, nor fully understand its impact until many years later, it showed me that something else was possible in a marriage. That something else was possible for a family. That something else was possible for me. And that seed of possibility, that glimpse of another reality, another opportunity, that sowed a seed in my life that made such a difference in my choices. Here's the thing about our congregations. They can be places of transformation in small and in large ways. And when they are communities of love and care and joy, they unlock possibility and hope in people's lives. And they make an untold change 
untold difference in the conditions of our lives, and it's not just personal. So let me share another story. One of the most important ministries that I ever was a part of was with a congregation that had been stuck for many years. This was a congregation that had had conflicts with ministers, difficulties and conflicts between members, and they often found themselves caught in internal conflict. You see, as powerful and beautiful as our theology is, grounded in relationship, covenant, and compassion, our congregations are made up of, well, human beings, just like me, just like you, just like my parents, just like those Sunday school teachers, beautiful, imperfect, struggling, hopeful, growing human beings. And as such, we can all stumble. We can all break covenant, fall into poor ways of practicing community. I mean, this project of human community is difficult, my friends. And I want to say that it's not about perfection. Right? Those Sunday school teachers who made such a difference in my life, I knew them. For, I still know um, the husband who's still living. They... They didn't have a perfect life or a perfect marriage. They had their struggles. And my parents gave untold gifts to the children whose Sunday school classes they led, right? It's not about perfection, but we offer and create possibility with one another here through our love, our commitment, and our joy. Now, this congregation that I was working with, though, they were experiencing the challenges, more of the challenges than the joy of human community. But then something began to shift for them. It started when a lay leader began asking the question, what would happen if our congregation simply disappeared? Would anyone notice? Would it make any real difference? With the challenge that this question offered, this community that had struggled so long realized that it had a larger purpose, that the community needed the ministry of Unitarian Universalism, and they'd better get to it. As one lay, lay leader put it, we realized we needed to do the community piece better. We needed to be a stronger, healthier congregation because it does matter, and not just to us in the room. It matters to the wider community, and city. So with this sense of purpose, they created a strategic plan aimed at congregational health and vitality, and they had one overarching vision for the plan, to become a beloved community. As Dr. King described the beloved community, he described it as both an inclusive community of love where all people can develop and be loved into the fullness of their being, as well as a community that cannot tolerate racism, poverty, and discrimination because it is such an affront to human dignity. This is religious community at its very best embodying a religious commitment to love and justice both within and beyond its walls. So to achieve this vision, which they didn't do perfectly, right? But to achieve this vision, they worked on better practices of covenant and right relationship within the community first. Given their painful history of conflict, they needed better practices that helped them welcome difference, disagreement, and honor covenant even across difference. They set goals that encourage greater collaboration across ministry areas. They move past silos of power into a collective sense of purpose. And this work nurtured growth in the congregation, not just in numbers, but far more importantly, in spiritual health, in generosity, in joy and creativity, and then in the quality of their ministry. But here's the thing, they not only found a renewed spirit in their ministry to one another, they became stronger partners for justice beyond. They took risks, they put themselves on the front lines, and they made clear and measurable differences for justice. They had rediscovered their great historic mission that King refers to, and it fired their souls and enkindled their imaginations for what was possible. 
Now, I share this story because I have seen too often how mission and vitality get undercut in our congregations because of our inability to navigate conflict and differences that come with any community. I've seen too often how our congregations can become too comfortable with privilege and the status quo, forgetting that we have a mission to live out in the world. And I think we've seen this playing out over the last couple of generations. We certainly see it playing out in our world today. As our humanity faces dramatic challenges of climate disruption and global migration, we hear the rhetoric of scarcity, isolation, and walls grow. This is a reactionary response that believes that the failing status quo can somehow be restored, however unjust, rather than responding from a sense of possibility that affirms our collective humanity and is willing to risk for a more just and equitable future for all. I realize that the challenges before us these days are terrifying in so many ways, but when we react out of fear, our hearts close off. And what we need more than anything is spiritual communities that tell our hearts to stay open, stronger, overflowing with a love and belief in the possibility of humanity. Throughout my first year in pre as your president, I've said two things have become absolutely clear to me. Number one, this is no time for a casual faith and no time for a casual commitment to your community. And number two, this is no time to go it alone. And mission is where these two things come together because the opposite of a casual faith is a fierce sense of purpose that recognizes how much is on the line. Mission and purpose, they call us out of fear, out of individualism and scarcity to a larger commitment beyond ourselves. And when we put a great sense of mission before us like living into the beloved community, we know we can't get there alone. We can't get there alone as individuals. We can't get there alone as individual siloed congregations, right? We need one another for this work. The challenges before us as a country are literally life and death. They are literally life and death for immigrants and migrants and children. Literally life and death for black and brown people, for Muslims and Jews, for women and trans folks. The list of people under threat continues to grow. Fear never makes us safer. Love is what lays the foundation for our future. And right now we need to fight harder and deeper to protect one another because the beloved community is about providing that safe space for a child who needs a break from a troubled home and that safe space for a family who is fighting desperately to stay together. Our communities can and need to be places of inclusive welcome and care where we can bring the fullness of our heartbreak, our fear, our anger, and be washed in a community of love that nurtures our resiliency and our courage. Worshiping communities, spiritual communities of real depth that help us glimpse the possibility of who we can be as human beings so that we might show up every day in our lives with humanity and love. Communities that answer the call to beloved community by resisting the dehumanizing conditions of poverty and oppression and exploitation because the difference between our churches being mere social clubs and being the church that they were founded to be is by answering our historic mission. You know, our forebears, the universalists, they didn't believe in hell except for the one that we create here in this life for people. And they were inspired by their theology to bring a powerful and active form of love to confront the forces of oppression that brought hell to people's lives. I like to say that the great historic mission of Unitarian Universalism is to love the hell out of this world. Right? Right? 
Love is life's most precious gift. And the capacity for love and the capacity for cruelty both live deep in the human heart. Religious communities help us nurture that which fosters love and fosters life. That's the spirit we need to practice each day, each Sunday, and bring it with us out into our lives. And I see the ways that you all here at First Houston are trying to do this. I see how you're beginning to embrace a deeper missional commitment to beloved community. I see how you're working on right relationship and covenant and care within. I see it in the way that I see it in your historic mission around racial justice and GLBT equality and support for queer youth in your larger community. I see how you're trying to live in right relationship with one another, with your staff, and with the UUA. And as UUA president, I dream of what it would mean for us to recover this great historic mission, to love the hell out of this world, and to unlock our bravest, boldest, most loving selves, because that is what is needed of us today, and it is the gift that we are able to bring. What it would mean to speak and act fearlessly and insistently in terms of justice and peace, democracy, and human dignity, to not be asleep. King said to Unitarian Universalists and his wear lecturer, do not sleep through the revolution. We must not sleep. Well, we must care for ourselves deeply, too. You must sleep. <laughs> but not through the revolution, right? Because I believe that one of the things that has led to the decline of institutional religion is that too many congregations and faith institutions grew complacent bound by the shackles of the deadening status quo. Too many failed to stand up, to speak out, and to fight harder as we were losing ground in this country on racial equity, losing ground on poverty, losing ground with mass incarceration, and the church remained largely silent or ineffective. Right? We must be the conscience of this country. There is power in our institution as Unitarian Universalists. That's why our commitment to it matters so greatly. Shortly after I was elected president, I got to go back to Elliott Chapel. My parents are still members. They found their way through those really difficult years, and the church had a huge role in helping them rebuild their marriage in mutual support and love. I got to go back to that church and to tell the members there, thank you. Thank you for your support for this congregation. You had no idea the way my life was being changed because of your generosity. In that same way, all of you here, through your commitment to this congregation, are changing lives in ways you will never know. You will never know all the stories of people whose lives have been nurtured, affirmed, and saved because of this ministry. We do not give because of what we get from our churches, although I know I have gotten so much. We give because of the mission and the ministry that is making so many things possible for so many people and communities. In this same way, when you all as a church support the UUA, you help us make a difference in the lives of congregations that you'll never visit and in the lives of Unitarian Universalists all over this country that you'll never meet. And we too want to be partners with you. We're supporting through the Disaster Relief Fund funds for your congregation raised from UUs all across the country to help as you continue to recover from Harvey. I want to bring the love and support of your siblings in faith to you. So more than anything, members, friends, staff, leaders of First UU Houston, I want to thank you for your commitment to the mission of your congregation and for your generosity to this community in this time. 
because right now all of our congregations and all of us as Unitarian Universalists are, become, are being called to a deeper practice of our faith and our theology and a deeper commitment to peace and justice in our larger world. We are being called to the beloved community. May we answer this call together. <laughs>